Welcome to Connecting the Dots, a laser-focused, quick-fire interview on food and the economy with international experts, where we seek answers to questions all of us should be asking. These are difficult times. The just-out UN climate change report notes that we may still have time to stop this catastrophic warming. But the world is led by countries and leaders who are very quick to commit, but do not act on those commitments. I'm Ajay Jakar, Chairman Bharat Krishik Samaj of Farmers Forum India, as well as the Vice Chair of Action Track 2, Shift to Sustainable Consumption Patterns at the UN Food Systems Summit. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Gunhail Stoddall, the Founder and Executive Chair of EAT Forum and the Chair of the United Nations Food Systems Summit, Action Track 2, Shift to Sustainable Consumption Patterns. Thank you, Gunhail, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Ajay. It's a pleasure to be here today. EAT Foundation commissioned the EAT Lancet Commission on Food, Planet, and Health, seeking answers to if we can feed a future population of 10 billion and healthy diet within the planetary boundaries. It generated unprecedented press coverage and conversations across the planet, a bold report that did not shy away from controversial subjects. Tell us about it and what's the most controversial aspect of it. Thank you so much, uh, Ajay, for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to explain a bit around this topic. So the Eat Lancet Commission was really a first of its kind uh, multidisciplinary scientific inquiry of our food systems and looking specifically of, at the health and environmental dimension of food. And without a doubt, the most important finding of the Eat Lancet was that, in fact, it is possible to feed 10 billion people enough healthy food within uh, planetary boundaries. But equally important, uh, this will require radical transformations. We need to shift to regenerative, sustainable food production. We need to transition to diets that are healthy and more plant rich. Uh, and we need to cut food loss and waste uh, by half within 2030. And about the most controversy, well, for sure, that was around the meat and livestock issue, red meat in particular. And there was some major misunderstanding uh, that took hold in certain quarters, namely that Eat Lancet was an all out attack on livestock and the meat industry, that is, was an, a vegan extreme activist uh, report. But the reality is that the Eat Lancet actually makes a strong case for livestock as an important part of food systems or of regenerative sustainable food systems and also to meet nutritional needs. However, we need to curb the growing overconsumption and overproduction of especially red meat, both because of climate and on all other environmental impacts. Uh, especially of industrial meat production, uh, and also because of the health costs of such overconsumption is unbearable. So just to end, the big problem is not uh, the cow, it's about the how. So factory farmed, grain fed industrial meat uh, is as bad for the planet as coal fired power plants, but regenerative free range grass fed livestock is a huge part of the solution, but that will mean less but better at the global level and a steeper reduction in OECD countries, also to allow for people in low and middle income countries to increase their consumption to achieve healthy levels. Such a statement one year ago would have ended all the controversies before they began. But coming to the next yeah. So. <laughs> Recently, a world, at a World Bank meeting, you have stated that diets kill 11 million people every year, more than tobacco, drugs, alcohol, and unsafe sex combined. What are the unhealthy diets, and is there a scientific basis to assert unhealthy diets? So an unhealthy diet is unbalanced, it's rich in calories, but it low, uh, it's low in nutrients. It contains too much refined grains, too much sugar, too much saturated fat, too much salt, and eating large quantities of white bread or rice and processed salty meat products combined with lots of soda, for example, is 
for sure not a healthy diet. And the science here is really very robust and increasingly well reflected in national dietary guidelines that we find around the world. And they all, for example, recommend increasing consumption of vegetables, whole grains, beans, other legumes, nuts, fruits, etc. Taxing unhealthy foods, high in unsaturated fats, salt, and sugar sound as a game-changing proposition. Can you give some examples where this has worked? And can we extend the same principles of physical levers on food emitting from industrial agriculture or industrial animal farming? Can we tax them? Uh, and where is it happening somewhere? Well, to start with, I mean, there is a reason why governments around the world apply taxes to stimulate demand or behavior by consumers, the private sector, etc., in a wide array of areas. And they do because taxes do work. And there is no reason why it should not work when it comes to food and beverage. Uh, we have seen that, for example, in Mexico and other countries that have introduced uh, uh, taxes on sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, the evidence and the evaluation show that these taxes do work. And this doesn't mean that it's enough in and of itself to apply a tax. We need for sure additional policy interventions just like in other policy areas, but we have seen positive uh, results uh, and, and really promising results uh, in certain countries. I mentioned uh, Mexico, but also Chile, uh, Norway, my, my own country. Uh, and I think this is uh, one piece of a much broader uh, uh, package of uh, different policy interventions. So what we are working for with the UN Food System Summit and with uh, my own organization EAT is really to uh, encourage and entice governments to apply uh, the political toolbox and create a coherent, um, comprehensive food policies uh, from agricultural subsidies through public procurement, taxes and incentives, all the way to uh, the national dietary guidelines. Uh, and all of this should work towards improving uh, public health, uh, protecting the environment, uh, improving livelihoods, and obviously have a strong lens on social uh, equity. So it comes to the second last question, which is in the past, research papers and efforts on food systems have largely ignored issues of farmer livelihoods, which is integral part of food systems. Will it be at the core of the Food Systems Economics Commission, which you have initiated? Tell us more about it and why is it different than what has been done before? Because this is really exciting. It is exciting. And we are talking about the Food Systems Economics Commission as a stern review for the food system or food systems uh, with a strong uh, focus on um, equity and uh, just transition uh, indeed, because what we, what we know is that there are so many hidden costs of today's food systems on health, on environment, on social inequality. Uh, and what we are asking the commissioners to, to look into is what is the cost of inaction today? What is unhealthy, unsustainable, inequal, uh, inequitable uh, food systems costing society? And what is the uh, potential for cost savings uh, and also the business opportunities by transitioning to uh, an Eat Lancet scenario, but with a just transition, uh, a strong focus on uh, equity. Uh, and it's also going to look into the political economy. Uh, so what, are, what policies do and do not work to support uh, this transition? Uh, and how can this happen in a way that protects uh, farmers' livelihoods, uh, for example? This is going to be a very strong component of the commission. Which gets us to the last more complex question. What are the biggest challenges of the UN Food Systems Summit? Is the inherent power structures within the food systems and if so, what are the power structures that you have encountered trying to get healthy diets to save the planet? That is a big question. <laughs> and I know you have told me to be, to be brief. Well, 
The biggest challenges we have, I think we uh, need to mention at least three uh, things. First, we, of course, still have a way to go until people around the world, including people in power, realize how urgent it is to transform food systems, how critically important it is to our future uh, as humanity on this planet. And I, the IPCC report that was uh, launched yesterday is just adding further evidence about the urgency. So our house is on fire. And I think uh, this summit is a huge and unique opportunity to really uh, make the case for food as part of climate action, but also uh, as part of addressing the biodiversity uh, crisis, uh, the health crisis, the inequality crisis, and food really at the center of the SDGs. Um, and second, I think exactly what you pinpointed, power structures and vested interests stand as a major challenge. Food and beverage uh, represents some 30% of the global economy. So this is obviously big business, both when you look at the big companies dominating many value chains, and when you look at the interests and the positions of specific countries, often reflecting the interests of big companies located or based in these countries. I'm not at all saying that this picture makes change impossible. Big actors can and must become part of real transformative change, but certainly that makes our, our job agile much more challenging. And we are seeing some really big uh, vested interests at play in the UN system. And the, the third challenge is really related to these two challenges. How can we use this summit to build an unstoppable movement for change where people, wherever they are, demand action, demand real far reaching change from governments, hold governments accountable, but also hold private sector accountable. And what I've learned now over the eight years uh, with EAT uh, in the food system space is that it's not enough to get science on the table and to get policymakers and business around the table unless people call and shout out for uh, change. This is not going to happen within the nine, year, nine years we have left to make a change and a transition uh, according to the science. So we really need to bring people on board and uh, empower them to, to uh, demand action now. Thank you so much. I think so you've summarized the, the circumstances that we're all working in very well. Thank you so much for this interview. We look forward to meeting you soon and taking the agenda forward beyond the UN Food System Summit, which comes to an end in September. Thank you so much for, for giving your time today. Thank you, Gunnar. So much, Ajay, and a pleasure working uh, side by side in this process with the summit. And I look forward to continue ramping up efforts together. Thank you. Thank you.